Coming to you from the University of Minnesota, Rochester, our town. At the end of December, the Federal Transit Association announced that Rochester will be receiving $765,000 in transit-related funds. Now, transportation has been a big issue, and it's going to continue to be a big issue as we think about the city's growth. And today, we have Cindy Steinhauser, who's the newly appointed Community Development Director of the City of Rochester, and Nick Lemmer, who's the Marketing and Outreach Coordinator for Parking and Transit. They'll be telling us a little bit more about what's in store for the future of transit downtown. Welcome to our town. Thank you. Thank you. So let's talk about this FTA uh, funding first. Um, what is that funding going to be used for? Sure, that funding comes at a great time. Last summer, the City Council and the DMCC Board both approved a series of recommendations regarding transportation in Rochester. And while many of the details of those transportation recommend recommendations were accepted, others were left to further study, including the transit circulator, uh, high-speed, high-frequency transit service that would connect parking and to downtown Rochester. And uh, this is really an opportunity to take that study of the transit circulator a little further and bring in some of the community development aspects of that, that service. So what is the timing for this, um, for the funding use gonna look like? It's 36 months, so we have a, a plan currently that takes us about 30 months uh, into the study. And transit circulator, that, that can seem like a really big term for people. Can mm -hmm. you just walk us a little bit through what, what, that, what that looks like? What is that? Well, it looks like, uh, like a LRT on wheels, basically. It's a, it's a different kind of service, like I said, high frequency, high capacity, something that will really co connect some larger parking cashments that are located outside of the uh, downtown core, and it will connect a large number of commuters into the downtown center. And Cindy, you just joined the city, you just joined this community, welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the departmental role that you've sort of taken on and, and how it intersects with these transit developments? Sure, it's a very exciting time to be in Rochester. So uh, we're going to be bringing the planning and development services component, which up to this point has been managed by uh, Olmstead County Planning. Uh, so those, uh, those planning and development services will come in-house to the city of Rochester. And it's a really exciting time because of things like the, the transit-oriented development initiatives that we're doing, this exciting study that we'd be doing that's, you know, the people mover, how we get people in and around our community, and how do we think about the public realm as it relates to the private development. What are some of the challenges and opportunities um, when talking about transit downtown? To me, I can take that a yeah, little bit. Ahead. So um, when we think about the growth that's been happening in Rochester and, and the projected growth. Obviously, there's people downtown that have these great experiences, and we want to make sure that um, they're, they're able to uh, get to the stores, they're able to get to work. And so transit's a critical, critical part of that. Nick, I guess if you want to add more to that. It could either be a factor that limits growth or really catalyzes mm -hmm. growth. Absolutely. I think that's what we're focused on here is how can we make transit something that spurs the economic development, that uh, gets sort of that long-term parking out of downtown and opens it up for visitors, people doing business, diners, shoppers, that kind of activity. Making downtown a really pedestrian experience. Certainly. And there's been a lot of efforts around the downtown area, really activating the downtown area. Um, how, are, how is that development going to impact Greater Rochester? And what are, the, are there other areas of the city that, um, that these initiatives might help? Um, or um, other ways that you're thinking about Greater Rochester? Sure. I, I think when we talk about community development, we, we have to think about all aspects of our community. And we've been fortunate that so much has been happening in downtown. It truly is the, you know, the urban core. Uh, and, and being very intentional about how we navigate development in downtown so it continues to be, we think about smart growth principles. But understanding and recognizing that downtown is an attraction for people who want to come and visit and explore as much as it is for people to work. And so making sure that we manage development in the fringe areas as well as um, positively influencing people's experience in downtown. So they want to continue to come downtown. Um, can you tell us a little bit about our, uh, your role? I mean, we only have a few minutes. I'm sure you'll be back to talk sure. with us. Sure. Um, but yeah, just tell us a little bit about your, your new role with the city. Sure. So we'll be bringing on development services. So whether you're a single family homeowner looking to do a, a, an addition onto your house or you're a developer looking to do an, a redevelopment project or a new development, those kinds of services will now, starting July 1, will come into the city. Anything that, any kind of development that happens within the city of Rochester boundaries will happen through the city planning community development department. And how can folks stay involved and up to date on what's happening with this transit circulator and with the developments in your department? 
The best way to go is to the uh, City of Rochester website, rochestermn.gov. We are, uh, we've got some new outreach staff and we're constantly posting new content there. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Stay with us, more Our Town next. Um, we'll be talking about LEFSA and uh, we'll be talking about historical preservation later in the show. I know, we're gonna let you go. Do I have a taker? Want to? Got that mitten off. Two fingers. Yep. Wrap your hand around. Now just open up. Let them fly. There he goes. All right. And this one, he is banded. So you can just let him go. So, well, we'll write down his number. Um, and then, yes, then we can just let him go. All right, so I'm Carrie Nelson. I'm one of the licensed bird banders here on staff. And we're here today at Quarry Hill Nature Center to do some bird banding over winter break. Two fingers under mine. Wrap your hand around. Don't squeeze too tight around the neck. And now just open up your hand and let it go. Yep, open up. <laughs> there you go. Um, so banding helps us uh, do a couple things here at Corey Hill. One, we can start to learn how long some of the species are living, and so it gives us an idea of ages. Um, it also gives us an idea of the population of our species. And then once we kind of get an idea of that, we can start to track to see if we're losing or gaining in those species, especially as the town grows um, and as climate changes, um, we can start to track to see um, how that's going to affect our birds. Uh, and we've been banding uh, since the late 1970s, early 1980s. We've been banding here in the park. So um, our original director, Harry Buck, started it and just has continued on. Uh, I definitely uh, feel like there should be more sports teams called the Fighting Chickadees because uh, they love to bite, they love to peck, they love to do anything they can to get out of your hand. I always just look to see like the condition of the feathers. If, you know, um, bo both the combination of this time of year, most of the birds should be done with their molts. So just checking. Um, that there isn't a bird that's kind of late in the process of molting out some of those feathers. And then just, all, yeah, condition, just to see if he's had a rough go and they're all tattered and torn up. And he is one from just this fall, so he has not been in our records for long. We have found that some birds, we call it hypnotism, it's not really like that, but some birds, if you kind of hold them upside down like this for a little bit, uh, if you kind of got that nice calming, calming sense to you, you can slowly, after about a minute, open up your hand and the bird will just keep laying in your hand, oh. kind of like it's hypnotized. Goldfinches tend to do it. Chickadees, woodpeckers, a little bit more hyper. Um, they don't like it, but the goldfinches we might have a, a pretty good success with. So, so two fingers under mine. Okay, wrap your hand around. Now just, there you go. And if you guys just hold still there, all right, why don't you very slowly start to open up those fingers. Kind of get it around the, under the head. Open up your hand flat. And he did it. Bird's not dead. We, I can see it breathing. All right, try wiggling a little bit. See if we can wake her up. Keep wiggling. Keep wiggling. I told you he was calm. Well, you know, we'll, we'll try something. Here. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta pop him away. He was born the fall of 50, made a fortune selling real estate. Golden lions waited at the gate. He was long. 
Happy New Year! I hope you're looking forward to new experiences in 2019. To kick off the year, the public is invited to gather for the inauguration of Mayor-elect Kim Norton, Councilmember Nick Campion, Councilmember-elect Patrick Keene, and Councilmember-elect uh, elect Sean Palmer on Monday, January 7th at noon. The ceremony will take place at the Mayo Civic Center, and in addition to the swearing-in of officials, there will be music and special readings by community members. In other city news, if you have a great idea for the reuse of the Chateau Theatre, now's your chance. The City of Rochester has issued an RFP. That's a request for proposal to all interested parties. The proposal will be evaluated based on how well they meet the management, vibrancy as part of the heart of the city, engagement with existing community groups, and more. All the details can be found at rochestermn.gov. Proposals are due February 15th. The Maltese Falcon, Airplane, Dave, Easy Rider, the Rochester Public Library is hosting a new series, Movies You Must See Before You Die. Now that's quite a recommendation. If you want to check out these titles and more off your list, gather at the library on the second Monday of the month, beginning January 14th, to watch the movie and engage in a discussion hosted by film critic Vernon Neal. More information at rplmn.org. The Science Museum of Minnesota exhibit, Race, Are We So Different?, is on display now through January 31st. The goal of the race exhibit is to help individuals of all ages better understand the origins and manifestations of race and racism in everyday life by investigating race and human variation through the framework of science. The exhibit is open from 10 to 8 Monday through Saturday and 11 to 7 on Sunday. The exhibit visits Rochester and is sponsored by the Rochester Public Library and the Diversity Council and admission is free. Details at diversitycouncil.org. Coming up next, let's get our rolling pins and make some lefsa in this week's Walkabout segment. This is Danielle Teal with Our Town Walkabout. I'm at the Rochester Library, and Pam O'Hara is going to teach me how to make a lefsa. Yay! It's so the most fun thing to do. I've actually lived in Minnesota for 17 years. I've never made lefsa. Get out. I know. So let's well, let's get cracking time. here. Okay. <laughs> all so, right. So First of all, what's inside left? Sure. What's in here is a uh, potato and Which butter. you told me before this and I was completely shocked. I thought it was flour. I couldn't believe that yep. potato is So there's potato. In it. Okay. And we add flour to it to make the dough stick together better. But there's okay. butter, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt. Okay. So I grab one of these. Yep. And then yeah. smash it down a little smash bit. Smash it down like on it? Yeah. Okay. Just a little bit. So yeah. I almost feel Norwegian right now. I'm actually you Scottish and Irish. Like so. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So I'm going to flatten it out. Try the lefsa roller. Straight under. Straight under. And then lift up. Woohoo! Yeah, you Look did at it. Look at that. And then I'm going to come over. So you lay it on the side with lay. the... With the stick, you're going to aim for the stick being in the middle. See. There you go. Okay. And then roll it. Oh, wow. Isn't that fun? So when is this typically made? Is it, is it during the holidays then? Oh, I think you can oh. flip it. Oh, we're, we got to flip. Okay. I smell so it right all down of the sudden. middle? Yep. Okay, so it's bubbling and then down the middle. Oh, it's oh, almost. It looks beautiful. So just lather it like toast then? Yeah, however you like it. Okay. And then maybe you want to shake a little sugar on shake it? Shake a little sugar on it. And then okay. roll it up. Roll it. Just roll yeah. it like a little burrito almost, yep. huh? Mmm. <laughs> What do you think? It's Isn't delicious. it amazing? <laughs> Especially since it's made of potatoes. I know. I could make those all day. I every know. Day. Good you. What is good you? That's Merry Christmas. Oh, okay. Okay. So all right. Okay. You ready to try it? I'm excited to try it. Good you. Good you. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. You did that good. really good. Yeah. I really did it. You did a job. good job. <laughs> <laughs> So before we leave that delicious segment, we actually have some of the lefsa, or the recipe at least, that Danielle got from that segment. And I'm going to try some because I've, I should try first, um, make sure it's still edible, and, um, and then maybe you can try some. Okay. Yeah? It's pretty delicious, although I'm not an expert. I think you two probably are better lefsa experts than I am. I'm not an expert at all. <laughs> I have a lefsa griddle. 
Ooh. <laughs> I just want you to know that. <laughs> Do any of you have Norwegian ancestry? I'm half Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. Well, this is fantastic. I, Delicious. It's really good. Yeah. I, I've loved Lafsa since I moved here three years ago, which is the first time I ever had it. Um, and speaking of Norwegian traditions, I think we'll be talking a little bit about heritage and traditions. Um, so moving right along to our next segment on historical preservation. The corn-shaped tower is one of the most recognizable landmarks um, in Rochester, along with many others. And um, that particular corn tower is going to be part of a proposal to the city that will be reviewed next week that will include several other sites. Um, today, I have Christine Schultz here and uh, John Creasel, who will be talking to us a little bit about historical preservation and its importance to the growth of the city. Welcome to our town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so to start us off, I, I, a lot of the conversation um, towards the end of the year was around the corn tower and uh, what's going to happen with the corn tower. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about um, the proposal that's being made to the city next week. Um, the proposal to the city next week is about potential designation. Our ordinance is written with uh, it's for local landmarks, and there is a list called potential landmarks that simply puts you into a list where you are considered, you're, there will be further research um, for potential local landmark listing. And it means that if you were planning to demolish, that it would get reviewed by the HPC. If you were planning to do work on it, it would get reviewed by the HPC. So it's a potential list, and that's important. Rochester um, is about 40 years late having an as heritage preservation ordinance, which means if we don't have a list that we're sort of considering as we um, make more normal this process of keeping historic buildings and adaptively reusing them, we'll lose them along the way. So the Corn Tower is on a potential landmark recommendation list. It's one of four buildings that are non-Mayo owned um, and then there are a number of buildings that are on Mayo's Methodist campus and St. Mary's campus that are also on that recommended list. Can you tell us about those four other? Um, it's items? not four other. They're okay. basically, it's the Corn Tower, it's the CC Heights, it's the Charles, how do I say the last name? Heard? Heard? I can't, I can't pronounce it. And I, it's, it's a house, Charles Heard House. And another house which is the uh, um, Babulian House, okay. which is a Frank Lloyd Wright House. The Charles Heard House is in the Institute Hills area of Rochester, and that's a, a house by Harold Crawford. And C.C. Heights is the mother house for the Sisters of St. Francis, which was built in the, in the 1950s, and then the Corn Tower. Sure. And so very different parts of our town. Certainly, and across the... Across and and the very different locations. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and what would be the next steps after that initial, um, I guess, review on Monday um, at the City Council? Um, that's a public hearing. Um, and my hope is the, this, the HBC, I believe, voted unanimously to recommend that they be added to the potential list. Um, and that's based on a review of what our charge is as an HBC, um, which is to basically retain heritage and incorporate it within the city and meeting criteria of what, what are the criteria it meets each building and what's the context. And a unanimous vote is quite amazing. Um, the Corn Tower probably drew the greatest conversation. We started with that. But actually, all four of them were um, intense conversations about they are representative of Rochester. And it's important to consider them more carefully before we lose them. So we don't plan the next steps. If it's on the potential list, then we sort of prioritize it with other things on the potential list. Okay, great. And John, a question for you, or unless you wanted to add something. Well, I just wanted to know if I could ask Christine mm -hmm. a question. Certainly. That charge that you mentioned, given to the HBC, uh, do you want to reflect at all as to how you f see the charge from DMC as it relates to the importance of authentic fabric in our community? Um, within the DMC master plan, heritage preservation is one of the linchpins that they talk about. And actually early on, sustainability was one of the things identified that they needed to carefully follow and heritage preservation also. Um, so I think that our ordinance is closely aligned with the DMC master plan. I would say honestly, because we're so late to the game, we still haven't figured out how to do it. I mean, in, in a lot of communities, heritage preservation is something that everybody works to do rather than everybody's sort of trying to figure out how to do it. Sure. So if you look at it, builders, owners, um, Mayo Clinic, um, people who live here, people who visit here, um, if we were working in concert, 
to um, adaptively reuse buildings, I think we would have great success. And I think that we would have a, the town that we've planned for. And if we don't do that, we won't have the town that we're plan we planned for. I'd like Does that to answer your question. Yeah, I, that's, that's, that, was, uh, that was wonderful. Thank you for that insight. Uh, I think that in the last few years, especially now even the last few months, this uh, task at hand, uh, namely that of incorporating um, the fabric of our community, our authentic fabric, fabric of our community, is no small task. I do believe that the, uh, that the Mayo Clinic, who is our major employer, and uh, that, that can be a problem when a community has one major employer. Um, it lends itself sometimes to uh, a lack of uh, bringing the community along. However, I believe that the Mayo Clinic has uh, recognized, uh, and we'll know more on Monday, I believe, uh, that the, uh, the citizens that live here and, and also the, the visitors that come here or the people that come here to work want to have a colorful community to live in. And one of the main pillars of that, I would suggest, is the fabric that can come from historic preservation, um, which also includes, uh, can include objects, parks, walkways, uh, so that people feel um, more welcoming to a community. I think, I think that this has become recognized not only by the clinic, but uh, other major power brokers within this community. So uh, here again, I'm going to say it's no small task bringing it all together Certainly. because of not having talked about it for the last 40 years. Yeah, both, both have alluded to this, I mean, not alluded, but directly said that it, we're a little, we're quite a, we're late, late to, to the, the game. game. Yes. Um, and bringing, bringing everyone together and along um, to that end, I mean, both of you are community members mm -hmm. um, and have you know, really been advocates and champions for historical preservation. Um, how, how can community continue to connect and really speak to the different power brokers into the city to make sure that this is an ongoing conversation um, and that some action is made moving it forward? How can the community do that? Yeah. Oh boy. That's a good question. Um, in, uh, but I'm going to turn it around. Um, I think it's time for the city, um, and the, the city is working on it. Um, the city is considering um, incentives and benefits that would go along with heritage preservation. Okay. The city has the new community development director who actually has background in heritage preservation. She um, worked with the Main Street program, I believe, in Dubuque. Right, and she won a, yeah, several And awards. she won awards for that. Um, so the notion for the city to now have community development um, is another big step. Most cities have had community development sorts of um, divisions, again, for decades. Um, and that's the sort of thing that brings together things like READY. Um, that these things are economic initiatives that support certain types of workplaces. Um, I think it's time for the city to actually engage with people to accomplish this rather than citizens to keep asking the city to do things. Um, and I, I think the city is aware of that. I might just um, uh, add a little bit and to what, what you said. Oh, yes. And oh, yes. If it's possible, I think just for people to know this, the buildings that are on the list in the first pass from St. Mary's and from Methodist campuses um, are the Eisenberg building and the Charlton building. Um, on St. Mary's campus, it's the Francis building, which people know from the entry off of 2nd Street. Um, the Joseph Building, the Alfred Building, the Convent Building, and the Chapel. So quite a few buildings. It's quite a few okay. buildings, and that's in the first pass. So, and again, I think part of your photographs may have some of these examples, which will be helpful. I think the thing that I would add is that you uh, mentioned you had mentioned the word incentives, mm -hmm. and uh, I do believe that with the help of um, outside consultants. Um, uh, and the clinic paying attention to the to the consultants as well as the our, our city um, have realized that um, we have lacked incentives. I would say the studies point out that here again um, to turn this community into a place where somebody might want to live and work uh, rather than leave on weekends. Uh, what are those incentives to keep us here? Thus far, the, the community has chosen 
to, I'm just, when I say the, the community, I'm talking about our, the city council has chosen not to fill a treasure chest with incentives to, let's say, building owners that might want to, to repurpose a smaller, smaller, less dense uh, facility. Thank you so much for joining oh, us. Okay. Um, we'll be staying tuned to Monday yeah. uh, to hear what happens and, and um, the community will be able to, 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 to hear from the city um, and, and what they think about the proposal. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, you we've for kicked, having us. We've kicked off the new year talking about the new and the old and we hope that you'll join us next week on Our Town, the show about Rochester here from the University of Minnesota, Rochester. Our Town is produced by KSMQ Public Television, nonprofit, non-commercial. Please help pay for this programming by making a personal contribution at ksmq.org. Thank you.